first joined the town square was quite new and the community center was something that was coming. The community center has often been something that's just been coming on the horizon. Uh, I guess the city bought it in 2000 and so now in 2020 uh, we're almost ready to break ground. We were supposed to have broken ground this year and there were a few delays with the uh, RFP, the request for proposals, and there's also been the delay now because of the pandemic. And uh, unfortunately, we're a little behind. The stage that we're at right now is uh, the community consultation. It has been a slow process, but again, it's, it's uh, something worth waiting for. It's a special property, a special building, and yeah, the benefits are endless, really. When the city had put together a proposal to turn this into a public works yard, uh, at the time there had been very little public consultation in the process. Uh, my neighbor and friend Susan O'Shaughnessy called me one night and said, hey, there's this organization called the RMRA and there's a meeting to look at uh, a proposal to turn this into a public works yard. So <laughs> we went to the meeting and the city was there, you know, the architects, the engineers, and they already had mock up the whole site plan of this, what it would look like, a big board with little trees. And, you know, they assured us, oh, the buildings won't be too big. They'll blend in with the neighborhood. We'll plant lots of trees and it'll be great. And, and we said, well, wait a minute, what's going to be in this public works yard? And well, dump trucks, garbage trucks, street sweepers, snow plows. So we thought, oh, hmm, not a good idea. So we started the process. We identified all these risks to the neighborhood in terms of environmental quality, safety, all the rest of that noise. Uh, so it was a matter of trying to educate the community, make them aware. And then once people started to understand what was possibly going to happen, people were very upset, very angry. People took it upon themselves to write to the mayor, the you know, city councilor. A whole bunch of us went down to City Hall to the council chamber with our kids and somebody must have given a presentation about what was the next step or what was uh, the um, item that we were encouraging the city council to approve. But it was really just a really impressive, I've been to the city council chamber for different reasons at different times, but, but I don't think I've ever seen so many kids there. It's usually adults, seriousness. I like this idea, I don't like this idea, that type of thing. So uh, the kids filled the council chamber. Uh, there were presentations, I guess there was decisions to be made, but it was just amazing. <laughs> it, was, it was because uh, the park, you see the people playing soccer here and, and uh, throwing frisbees around and that sort of thing, but also the community center really is for them. It's for adults, and there's certainly uh, adults who are getting a lot of good use out of it, but it was really looking to the future. Helen Gardner was the president at that time, and it was at that time, which would be uh, late 80s, probably 88 maybe in there somewhere. Um, we were aware of this site, which was the old TTC site, and we were aware of the proposal by the city that was being presented to turn this into a public works yard. We, we didn't want a public works yard, so we opposed it. First couple of meetings we had, there were maybe 20 people that came, but you know, through knocking on doors and putting up flyers, we had a meeting in the auditorium at Fern School. And I think that was really the turning point for the city to realize there's a lot of opposition to this. So let's go back to the drawing board. The city and Chris KK came to a meeting at Fern Public School with a drawing of a postmodern building that filled the whole southwest corner of the site with glass block walls and closed it off to people. Well, over 400 people came that night and they were loud. I think a park would be good there, as long as it's looked after. We if it's not looked after, we don't want that either. Over here. Chris. It was exciting in the sense that it was a lot of work, but then when the momentum started to change, people started to get engaged, and it was inspiring, you know, just to 
to see the support and, and the engagement of the community to get on board with it and, and people volunteering, people giving money, you know, it costs money to mount a campaign, you know, to do things. So uh, that's, I think that was the most satisfying part was, was actually just being able to create or stop something that was almost a done deal and to watch local politicians suddenly flip and watch them change their story, change their tune. I have this special letter. I brought about 300 of them here. It's got every member of council on it, including myself. Well, please don't call me because I'm on your side already. Uh, it's a great lesson in you know, the community gets together and give them the, the information, the facts, and you know, fight City Hall or something. And I guess in, in terms of a concluding remark is you can fight City Hall. The city backed down completely. They backed down and said, what do you want? Said, we need a park. How about a park, you know, for our kids? And so that's, that's, uh, that's where it went. The atmosphere was joyful because we finally had the park and it was going to be officially opened. And I think it was to see the results of all our hard work, to see the results of people coming together as a community and achieving something. This was also pre-amalgamation Toronto. So Toronto had a lot more control over what they could do. And I think that's also one reason we were able to get the parks. So, uh, so a big part of the story of Sororan Park and the Fuchsia Fieldhouse is neighborhood involvement, is the activism in this area. It's a wonderful area to live in, but it's also an area that's filled with inspired people. There was a literal ribbon that was cut, and you can see in the pictures, and uh, there were a lot of people here. A lot of people in the community came out to celebrate, and it was just a very happy event that we had finally accomplished this, that we had finally gotten a park after all this struggle. A few years after that, the city said, we don't, we're not sure that we've got our act together for the big building here. But there is a smaller building um, that I, I believe was used for executive offices for the um, linseed oil company uh, originally. Maybe we can do something with that. And it's not as big a budget, too. And um, I think it's uh, turned out it's a very robust building in, in construction, fortunately, as I say. It's turned out to be extremely well used for all kinds of purposes. Uh, maybe, at least subliminally, some people were not giving up on the community center, but they were saying, well, in the meantime, let's have a little mini community building here. And, uh, and so, it's, so it's been very well used uh, from, that, from that standpoint. The significance is not just for me, but I think for the whole community, that we had a place we could come to, uh, that people could be physically active, people could gather for community. We started the pumpkin parade, they call it. Uh, it's all over the city now, and I guess the imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but I like to remember that we were the first ones to do it. Yeah, my best memory of volunteering for Sorian Park was the parade night. It was very interesting. And I invited a few of my friends who, who they don't live in this neighborhood, they live in another part of Toronto, and I invited them just coming. It's interesting because I remember the first time I heard about this parade night one night I myself I didn't know anything about it I saw the park is dark but it's, it's full of candle and people just walk around and it was beautiful it was mesmerizing I just walked into it and I saw it and I was shocked that that's such an interesting art event that people created themselves without any curator or without any direction it was just beautiful magnificent that's why the next the, the year after i wanted to work with that i was like oh i i love to be part of this that's just such an amazing event when you come out and you have hundreds of people and the whole community participates and there's hundreds of pumpkins you could see political <laughs> going political eras through the ages you know as you saw carvings of different political figures and some wonderfully creative stuff it's always amazing 
it's always a bit embarrassing for a guy like me whose uh, mechanical and visual uh, abilities and aptitudes are near zero. So when I put my uh, pumpkin, I usually put it at the far end by the tennis court. And then I observe all of the amazing Star Trek and Star Wars designs and calligraphy and Justin Bieber depictions and Drake depictions. And those are kept in the middle. And that's where they should be because mine sits at the far end where people just sort of don't really notice it. And that's okay. And what's nice is that you often buy your pumpkin here because folks like Chandra Chada and other people in the neighborhood put together a pumpkin drive. So you buy your pumpkin here and the money gets donated to the field house. And then you bring it back, right, on November 1st. And uh, it's quite an amazing, it comes full circle. But it's an amazing, amazing evening on November 1st. And that's, again, a part of what this park is all about. It's again that sense of community that I think has always made Toronto so fabulous that even though we're a big city and even though uh, there's so much density that you have a place where you have room to spread out. You have a place that you can be physically active, where your children can engage with other children, where people can engage with other people. And it gives you that sense of belonging, of having a community that you're responsible for and that you're committed to. Well, one of the things that uh, I guess, you know, encourages us to come back is, is to see the community come together and the effort that a lot of the neighbors put together. So, you know, we live on the east side of Toronto. And so we, we, we you know, sort of stumbled upon this volunteering opportunity. Uh, but it's great to see how the neighbors come together and, and really, you know, have created this space based on the community's needs uh, for everyone to gather. And every year there seems to be something new, like the pizza oven. I remember when that was built and things like that. So it's, it's inspiring and it wants, you know, it, it makes you feel like you want to come back and contribute. Uh, once I did move back to the neighborhood, which was a natural thing to do, because I love it here. Uh, that, and then, you know, I started to get involved again. And, you know, I'd, I'd worked with the Red Cross also by that time, and it was really the, 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 the idea of volunteerism, um, not just the idea, but the action especially, is, is I think, critical to, to a successful community. If you don't have volunteerism, you don't have people really buying into it. They're, they're not just there sitting on their properties waiting them, for them to appreciate or, or you know, doing other things that aren't uh, committed to sharing and, and, and giving part of yourself and your time and your effort. And FOSP is all about that and it's hugely successful. I mean, you see the markets here, you see the, uh, the movie nights, uh, the rink, you know, everything they do. It accommodates all the things that communities want to have happen. Uh, but, you know, you need people to coordinate that. So the biggest change is programmatic and administrative an evolution of Friends of Sonoran Park. And then thanks to Doug Bennett and Joel Campbell and FOSP, they, they've they really turned it into a super organized, efficient and productive uh, organization. Everything they do is, is, is has a goal and touch to it because it's volunteers. No, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity uh, for a family to teach, uh, for parents to teach their children about service, about a positive, having a positive impact in your community, contributing. And uh, we've really enjoyed it. It's, a, it's great for families with young children because you can bring them and, you know, it's a sort of a safe environment to, to do this type of work. We've really enjoyed it. It was in 95, 1995, that we did the first hosing. Since then, the uh, skating rink in the wintertime has developed, which is an amazing thing. It's totally a citizen-led initiative. You put the water on the ground, and if it's cold enough, it freezes, and you got a skating rink. One of the memories I have is my dad, because he's a stickler and he's crazy. It's Christmas Eve, I think it was like four or five years ago, and he said, it's my day to flood the rink. I need to flood the rink. I'm like, Dad, it's Christmas Eve. What the hell are you doing? Like, take a break. I was like, no, I need to flood the rink. And my mom said, you're at home, you're not paying rent. If your dad goes out there, he's gonna break his back or whatever, you're going. I'm like, well, crap, now I can't say no. And so I came out here with my dad and somehow my, my mom convinced my sister to come out too. And then we flooded the rink on Christmas Eve 
negative 30 degree temperature in the middle of a blizzard. Um, so if I don't know this part pretty damn well, I don't know who else did, as I was shoving snow off on Christmas Eve to flood the damn rink. Uh, memory which at the time was very cold and not great, but I have come to appreciate it more over time as this is one of the more like traditional Christmas movie memories you could ever possibly have. So. Yeah, I'm an official Soren Park hoser. These guys, Nithin and Zakir, have been here helping uh, to build and take down the rink uh, at the start of every winter and at the end of every winter. And uh, I started doing that uh, before uh, Elected Life entered my life, but uh, I'd heard from a guy in my street uh, that, you know, this is a good community initiative and I got involved and there's nothing like getting together with some of the folks in the neighborhood and getting some nails and hammers and a few power tools and building rinks. Sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's easier, but it's really blossomed. So you see now we've got corporate sponsors, we've got people that have helped us buy uh, pizza and other beverages for after we build so we can refresh ourselves. Uh, and also uh, we've actually gotten so good at the technique that it's been adopted by other people in other parts of the city. The, the, over the years, the, the whole process has changed. We, we had, uh, we have people that take great pride in learning how to make ice. And we, and we've tried uh, different hosing methods and, uh, and nozzles. And we, uh, we've gone from having very heavy rubber hoses to now we have some lighter uh, fire hoses that we bring out. Um, getting the building was, a huge change because uh, I only helped out a couple times in the very early years when we used to have to use the fire hydrant. Uh, so once we got the building, that made life much easier to get water and, and, and flood flood the rink. Uh, and it, and the uh, the hosers, the one year we had, uh, uh, we still had the rink open, and the city of Toronto closed all their rinks two weeks earlier. So we were the only operating rink and ours was natural ice in downtown in the downtown area. I remember people literally driving here to use the ice rink. Because they didn't have one close or didn't have one where you could just kinda go. Right? Again, the only closest one is the one on lands down where you have to go to Swanson. Right? So just being people would come here to see the park from outside of the neighborhood. And that tells you that this park is special. I think one of the in interesting aspects of the park itself since 1995 is how the uses have expanded. So today we have a farmer's market here. If it weren't for COVID-19, uh, we'd be uh, having our birthday this year. We'd be celebrating uh, 13 um, seasons uh, here at Sororan. Um, so the market is run by myself and we also have a board of directors. And we were lucky that we, you know, we were lucky that we have the support of the Friends of Sauron Park. Uh, it was actually one of the members, Chanda Chara, who was um, very helpful to us uh, why, as we were getting started as an independent nonprofit at the beginning of 2019. So he helped us out a little financially. So that was really great. So. Right now, if you pay attention, this, um, this market, the Sauron market, it's a place that people gather. It's not only a place that people come and shop. It's a place that people like to come, spend time, meet each other. And it's, it's, a, it's a destination. Farmers markets link uh, rural communities and, and obviously urban communities, and it's a place to access fresh fruit. Um, but more than that, I actually think it's kind of like a, a gentle, subtle sort of teaching tool, uh, especially for children. Um, coming to the market is a uh, it's a very sort of pleasurable sensory experience. Um, so you're here and you're you're connected. You're you're more grounded. You're in the park. You're out in nature. Um, you know, very cognizant of the weather uh, in the same way that maybe a farmer would be to a small degree. Oftentimes it will rain in the park, so you know we're we're aware of things like that. So you are standing there, and you know potentially the person that's right there in front of you is the one who has planted, tended, and even harvested. The food that you're about to eat so that's a uh, pretty special it's quite an intimate connection it's a hub right like it's really it's it, it might it, it draws people from all over maybe. so obviously i live in ronsville it draws people from the very southern regions of parkdale draws people from sort of uh the riding of davenport that my colleague represents on the other side of the track people just cross over it's got an amazing farmer's market as you can see today and every monday but it's um 
it's a place where people congregate. Like I've loved it recently during COVID. You know, it's been hard to play baseball here because there's lots of Tibetans and other South Asians play cricket here. So people use it for what it is and they make the space their own. And it's a true statement that reflects the character of the community. There's a dog park, there's a soccer pitch that was uh, that was redeveloped a bit by MLSC, which is nice. You know, my son loves playing pickup basketball across the street at Charles D. Williams. We use the tennis courts very, very frequently, particularly during the pandemic. So it just draws people in. And the addition of the uh, of the uh, of the pizza oven behind us has been a huge plus because I haven't done this personally, but I know you can book it out and use it. So you could throw a birthday party here inside Wabash, play you know mini soccer with your kids and make pizzas for as part of the party and it's all self-contained so it's really amazing in terms of being a magnet and a hub and what's really nice is that everyone congregates around here and people really care to look after the park uh, which is nice and that's not often the case for all city parks but this is one where I feel, truly feel that because the community is so invested in it the community looks after it. So I love the town square um, it's this intentional space it, it's sort of states that you know community life is important here um, and you know the farmers market is on it friends of Saron Park run you know various um, activities that are there um, and so I think that says a lot if, you know a, a town square is sort of the, the center of a community um, you know rituals are created there uh, children in this community are creating amazing memories um, of the activities that they um, you know, they do here in this space. And I love, you know, looking across um, the square to the Wabash uh, Community Center development, which is coming. So one of the interesting parts of the discussion at that time was how long are we going to have to wait until the community center comes? Because we're looking at little guys that are six or eight or 10 years old. Are they, are we going to get a community center while they're still kids? My name is Nathan Bennett. Uh, just like the park, I just turned 25, so I kind of grew up with the park. Uh, my parents, I should probably add, are Doug Bennett and Nancy Clark, who have been a part of the Wabash Building Society slash now Friends of Saron Park since pretty much my entire life. One of my earliest memories, ironically, of the park is not being in the park, but being at a booth on Ross's Bales promoting all of this. 20 years ago, uh, I was with, my dad just kind of dragged me along. I didn't really want to be there. I was five. Uh, but I remember sitting in the booth and him going out and talking to people on the street, promoting what this could be. Most, uh, if not eight or nine out of 10 of the areas that were identified as needing community centers, uh, those all community centers have been built now. So we know that we knew and we've known that our time is coming. Um, it's unfortunate that some people that donated to the community center when their kids were young, um, their kids have kids now, practically, almost. Uh, that's a bit of a stretch, but it is. Uh, it has been a slow process, but again, it's it's uh, something worth waiting for. It's special property, a special building, and uh, it's going to have a lot of impact on the community. I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be a huge plus. I mean, there. Uh, it's been a long time in, in coming. And I know it's been uh, something that people have advocated for at every level of government. So myself, my provincial, my city counterparts have been advocating for it. I think it's needed in terms of sort of the density of the population here. Um, I think there's been some challenges and fairness about sort of how big its footprint is going to be and what it, it will consume and what it, what it won't consume. I'm hopeful that that can be worked out uh, because I know it would be nice to have sort of a place where you can animate indoor and outdoor activities. And I'm also keen that what I understand and what I've been pushing for personally as an elected representative is things like ensuring that the carbon footprint is kept low on the building and also ensuring that it reflects some aspect of uh, the indigenous heritage of this area, right? So for those who are watching the video, they might know that we have an Indian road, an Indian grove, an Indian road crescent, an Indian trail, etc. These are very historic areas for 10,000 years and it would be nice to incorporate some of that learning and teaching within that building. I think the community has an appetite for that as well as an appetite for this market, which is a tremendous market. We need to be configured differently because if the building subsumes a bit of the land where the current farmer's market is positioned, we'd have to place the market somewhere in a slightly different position. But keeping the market alive is critical and keeping the different facets of it, whether it's the field house, whether it's the pizza oven, hopefully all of those can be incorporated into it. But I think for the most part, it's going to be a positive development. It's going to make the, the area even more vibrant and animate the bigger space what better place to do programming than these, this beautiful park. Um, 
And it's also going to be a hub for the community. Uh, there, we're hoping for some event space, some rental space, dance studios, music studios, recording studios, possibly a, an aquatic center, uh, gym. And so, so all that stuff uh, with our, the, the way that our community is right now, the way that it's growing up and uh, how our, our, our schools, our primary elementary schools are bursting at the seams. Uh, it'll give us one more outlet uh, nearby that we can walk to. So it's, it's super important. And, uh, and yeah, the benefits are endless, really. We discovered a whole new world when we brought our kids to the park and then got them involved in the, in the programs uh, and made a whole new group of friends that we, we hadn't up to that point. Um, I think it's one of the great things about the, the Parkdale, Roncesvalles neighborhood is that uh, uh, it's very people oriented and, and it's a pretty tight community. And hopefully we'll get the Wabash building soon and, and get that complete and it'll really round out this neighborhood. I think what's important is that people have started to, for one reason or another, because you know the, the notion of a, getting on a plane and going on a trip for vacation somewhere else in Canada or abroad is not really on right now. So people are engaging with nature a bit more. And what's nice is that because the carbon footprint of the country, if not the planet, has gone down, people are seeing sort of wildlife and ecological phenomena that they hadn't really observed in the past, right? So whether that's foxes or deer on city streets in Toronto, or, you know, I have cousins in India that are seeing the mountains from New Delhi, mountains they've never seen in 50 years, right? So it's happening all over the planet, but a local park helps people engage with nature when nature is so much more valued right now. And hopefully that continues post pandemic that people appreciate what this park has meant to them during the pandemic when they're feeling sort of isolated and contained within their own homes. And that continues going forward, so people continue to use the park, but using it responsibly and helping to maintain it most of all. It's hard to believe the neighborhood without it. And it, it just, to me, makes another reason why this is, to me, the best community in the world to live in.